In the dimly lit streets of Barrio Rivadavia, near the Buenos Aires Cemetery of Bajo Flores, a chilling encounter unfolded on Sunday, April 11, 2010. Rodrigo Escura, a 27-year-old philosophy student, found himself in a harrowing situation, confronted by a group of young people led by Marcelo Alejandro Antelo, known as Marcelito. Escura, his new bicycle, wallet, and phone already taken from him, pleaded, I'm not going to give it to you, you'll kill me first. But Antelo, unyielding, retorted, you ask me, son of a bitch, before firing a fatal shot into Escura's chest with a 9mm gun. Escura's desperate venture through the dark streets hinted at a deeper struggle, one driven by insatiable cravings. Little is known about the depths of his desperation, but it led him to a fatal encounter in the hallways of the Rivadavia 2 buildings. Cornered, he surrendered his belongings without resistance, but resisted when Antello demanded the drugs he had just purchased. Despite his compliance, it seemed Escura's fate was sealed. Unbeknownst to Escura, his tragic demise marked the beginning of a horrifying spree orchestrated by Antelo. This murder was merely the first in a series of heinous acts, between four and six, with additional failed attempts, perpetrated by Antelo over the next five months. Shockingly, these crimes were carried out as part of what investigators referred to as a pact with San La Muerte, the saint of death. Antelo had made a sinister promise to the saint one death a week in exchange for protection for himself and his family, ensuring a constant supply of drugs. This dark covenant set off a wave of violence, leaving a trail of victims and terror in its wake. The San La Muerte Killer, a pact with death. Chapter one, a spree of violence. Before the brutal murder of Escura, Marcelo Antelo's criminal history had been relatively minor, devoid of any significant violent incidents. His upbringing was marked by a tumultuous family life, characterized by his grandmother's alcoholism, his father's addiction issues, and his mother's tendency to resort to violence. In early 2010, at the age of 22, Antelo, also known as Marcelito, had a brush with the law when he was pulled over by a patrol car from the 38th police station while driving alone in a stolen car. Although initially charged, he was ultimately released. Digging into his records, the Criminal Recidivism Registry revealed a prior incident from February 2009 where he was declared in absentia by a court in Lomas de Zamora for failing to appear as a witness in a robbery case. These incidents constituted the extent of his criminal history until he embarked on his disturbing spree of violence. At the time of Escura's murder, Antelo resided in a house marked with number 1018 in the Rivadavia neighborhood, cohabiting with a group of fellow addicts known locally as the Kindergartners. Living under the same roof as Jorge Mancilla, the owner of the house, Antelo's relationship with Mancilla soured leading to his eviction. In the wake of this, he vowed revenge. True to his word, Antelo wasted no time in seeking vengeance. On the night of June 24th, he ambushed Dario Romero, another former housemate, shooting him in the hand with a shotgun. Despite Romero's writhing pain, Antelo refrained from delivering a fatal blow, instead reveling in his cruel act. Antelo's thirst for revenge escalated further on August 2nd when he targeted Mancilla's residence. He called out Mancilla's name, demanding his presence and when met with silence, he fired at the house. Six days later, in the early hours of August 8th, he returned to the scene. This time, without uttering a word, he rang the doorbell. When Mancilla opened the door, he was met with Antelo's cold stare. It was the last sight Mancilla beheld before Antelo ruthlessly ended his life, shooting him in the head with a 9mm pistol. Chapter 2. The Fortunate Escape of a Mechanic A few hours after the chilling murder of Mancilla, Marcelito remained at large in the neighborhood, fueled by a thirst for vengeance. His target this time was the mechanic Mario Chiero, who, in reality, owed nothing to Antelo, but rather to one of his acquaintances, who he owed 300 pesos for a car repair job that had never been completed. For context, that's around $15. Yet for a bloodthirsty figure like Marcelito, such details were inconsequential. Antelo confronted Chiero at his workshop, situated in a garage beneath the mechanic's residence demanding the money. When Chiero refused, Antelo, without uttering a word, retrieved a 9mm pistol from his clothing and attempted to pull the trigger. One, two, three times he tried, but the pistol jammed, failing to fire. Taken aback, Marcelo inspected the gun, managed to unlock it, and fired a shot into the air to confirm it was working. However, this delay allowed Chiero to retreat upstairs and barricade himself inside his home. Instead of retreating, Marcelito began firing at the front of the house, all while bystanders remained passive, failing to intervene or alert the authorities. Eventually, Chiero's wife, from a window, negotiated with Antelo. She offered him 150 pesos, all the money they had, in exchange for him leaving them in peace. Reluctantly, Antelo accepted the offer. However, 
As the woman descended to hand him the money, he issued a chilling threat. If I ever see your husband again, I'll kill him, he warned before casually walking away, blending into the neighborhood as if he hadn't just terrorized an innocent family. Chapter 3. More Tragedy and the Pursuit of Justice The final two murders orchestrated by Marcelo Antello echoed the brutality of his initial crime, where Rodrigo Escura fell victim. On the night of August 15th, Marcelo Cabrera, 28, and Pablo Zaniuk, 26, like Escura before them, navigated the dim passageways of Barrio Rivadavia in search of drugs. In a chilling repeat of his modus operandi, Marcelito and an unidentified accomplice intercepted them in a corridor near house number 107, close to Korea Street. Threatened at gunpoint, both young men relinquished their belongings, but tragically, it did not spare their lives. Zaniuk met his end with a fatal shot to the face, while Cabrera suffered nine gunshot wounds to various parts of his body. At this point, Law enforcement was actively pursuing Antello, eventually leading to his capture 13 days later. On the morning of Saturday, August 28th, officers from Police Station 38 spotted him on the corner of Esteban Bonarino and Oceania in the Rivadavia neighborhood. When ordered to stop, Marcelito responded with gunfire, but thankfully the police managed to subdue him. Upon his arrest, it was discovered that Antelo was carrying a 9mm pistol accompanied by two fully loaded magazines, bearing an intact serial number and a federal police shield. Further investigations confirmed that this weapon had been stolen from an officer on March 26th, just a few months prior. Moreover, ballistic tests revealed that this pistol was the same one used in the fatal shootings of Escura, Mancilla, Cabrera, and Zaniuk. According to the case investigators, Antelo could potentially be linked to two additional murders in Bajo Flores between April and August 2010. However, conclusive evidence to support these claims remained elusive. Chapter 4. A Pact with Death the true nature of Marcelo Antelo's sinister spree began to unravel after his arrest, hinting at a connection with a pledge he had made to San La Muerte, a saint not recognized by the Catholic Church in exchange for protection. Close relatives of Antelo disclosed to investigators that he was a devoted follower of this obscure saint, and that he had entered into a dark covenant, promising one life a week in return for San La Muerte's sheltering embrace. A witness revealed a chilling detail. Marcelito had allegedly recorded himself with Escura's pilfered cell phone, articulating his vow to kill a person every week as part of his pact. Strangely, this phone never surfaced, leaving behind a mysterious void. Following Antelo's apprehension, journalists delving into the heart of the Rivadavia neighborhood were met with an impenetrable wall of silence. Amidst this silence, journalist Liliana Caruso managed to extract a crucial testimony, shedding light on the unsettling promise. A relative of Antelo, who chose to identify himself as Jorge to avoid repercussions, cautiously revealed, Some things that are said are true, others are not. I didn't see him very often due to my work commitments. What I can affirm is that the young man initially embraced evangelism, and everything seemed fine. However, at some point, he became entangled with a sect worshipping San La Muerte. That's when he started uttering strange things, engaging in peculiar activities. He vanished from here and was never seen again. San La Muerte commonly known as the Saint of the Good Death, exists on the fringes of religious recognition tolerated by the Catholic Church. This religious figure finds a fervent following in the Argentine Mesopotamia, the province of Buenos Aires, and select provinces in the northern regions of the country. The supposed devotion of Marcelo Antelo to this saint, coupled with his vow to commit murder in exchange for the saint's protection, may appear to be rooted in the cult of San La Muerte. However, the true essence of this cult diverges significantly from the perception that Antelo's actions might suggest. Despite its intimidating name and image, San La Muerte is merely one among several revered figures in a popular saint's pantheon, which includes Gauchito Gil, Defunta Correa, and even contemporary icons like Gilda and Potro Rodrigo. These figures coexist alongside more traditional religious entities such as the Blessed Seferino Namuncura and various incarnations of the Virgin Mary, explains anthropologist Alejandro Frigerio a researcher at Conicet. San La Muerte, positioned at the less orthodox end of this spectrum, is perceived as a potent spiritual entity capable of aiding troubled devotees. Those who practice this devotion, increasingly prevalent across the country, do not venerate death as an antithesis to life. Instead, they anthropomorphize it, endowing it with human qualities, portraying it as the most just of the saints, the one who ultimately embraces everyone, regardless of their wealth or poverty, Nevertheless, certain prayers to this saint can lead to misinterpretations and subsequent misguided actions. One such prayer reads something like this, though keep in mind I had to use Google Translate to turn it into English so it may be slightly inaccurate. Saint Death, spirit skeletal and strong, beyond measure, your majesty like Samson, indispensable in moments of danger, I invoke you. 
Certain of your benevolence, I pray to Almighty God, grant me all I seek from you. Let remorse grip the one who harmed or cursed me. May they face your wrath instantly. For those who deceive me in love, I beseech you to bring them back to me. And if they disregard your mysterious command, mighty spirit of death, let them feel the might of your scythe. In games and business, I appoint you my best counsel. And to all who stand against me, may they forever meet defeat. O oh, Saint Death, my guardian angel. Amen. Chapter 5. Condemned. In the wake of his capture, a lengthy legal battle culminated in Marcelo Antello receiving a life sentence on September 14, 2012, handed down by the Oral Criminal Court No. 27 of the Federal Capitol. The sentence held him accountable for the heinous murders of four individuals, Rodrigo Escura, Jorge Mancilla, Federico Zaniuk, and Marcelo Federico Cabrera. Additionally, Antello was convicted for causing injuries to three others, Jorge Diaz Armas, Jorge Quiero, and Dario Romero. Throughout the proceedings, Marcelito maintained a bowed head, seemingly engrossed in silent prayer, refusing to exercise his right to address the court. His defense, in a bid to overturn the verdict, lodged an appeal challenging the constitutionality of the life imprisonment sentence. In a pivotal ruling in June 2014, Chamber 3 of the Federal Chamber of Criminal Cassation dismissed the defense's appeal and upheld the original sentence. Regarding the claim of unconstitutionality, the judges asserted that the sentence imposed on Antelo does not exceed the bounds of proportionality considering the enormity of the injustice and the degree of culpability exhibited by the accused individual. Conclusion In the chilling saga of the San La Muerte killer, Marcelo Antelo's gruesome crimes and the terrifying promises he made to the obscure saint have left an indelible mark on the annals of criminal history. Through a series of heartless acts, he shattered the lives of innocent victims and plunged an entire community into fear and despair. The relentless pursuit of justice, however, prevailed, leading to Antelo's conviction and life imprisonment for his heinous deeds. This harrowing tale serves as a stark reminder of the dark corners of belief and devotion, where individuals can be driven to unimaginable lengths by their warped convictions. In the aftermath of this disturbing chapter, the affected community remains scarred but resilient, determined to heal and rebuild, united in their shared determination to ensure that such horrors never recur. The actions of the San La Muerte serial killer were extremely brutal and disturbing, but whether Marcelito really had made any sort of pact with the saint of death, as claimed by his family and the police, is ultimately unclear. Especially given most of his crimes appear, at least to me, to be focused exclusively around drug addiction and revenge, rather than anything particularly occult or ritualistic. What do you think of this haunting case? Would you like to see me cover more obscure international crimes and serial killers such as this Argentinian story? If so, let me know down in the comment section below. As always, thanks so much for watching and please like and subscribe as it really does help the channel to grow. I appreciate all of your support so far and hope we can continue to build a great community of mystery and true crime enthusiasts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.